Jogina Krita Maitrasya Jogina Krita Maitrasya Patyur Jai Vapunshali Nityam Dadati Kamasya Nityam Dadati Kamasya Chidram Tham Anuhiraya Chidram Tham Anuhiraya Jogina Krita Maitrasya Jogina Krita Maitrasya Patyur Jai Eva Pumschali Patyur Jai Eva Pumschali Nityam Dadati Kamasya Nityam Dadati Kamasya Chitram Tham Anuhiraya Chitram Tham Anuhiraya Jogina Krita Maitrasya Jogina Krita Maitrasya Patyur Jai Eva Pumschali Patyur Jai Eva Pumschali Nityam 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 Siddha Siddha I lost my voice last night. Dadati Dadati Dayu Kamasya Kamasya Vosdurinu Vosdurinu Chidram Chidram Sometimes happens that her husband is violently, violently killed by her paramours. If the yogi gives his mind a chance and does not restrain it, his mind will give facilities to enemies like lust, anger, and greed, and they will doubtlessly kill the yogi. <laughs> Если йоги дает своему уму шанс и не возвращает его под контроль, то тогда ум даст возможность таким врагам, как вожделению, гневу и жадности, и они, несомненно, убьют йоги. In this verse the word Pumchali refers to a woman who is easily carried away by men. Such a woman is never to be trusted. Unfortunately, in this present age, women are never controlled. According to the directions of the Shastra, women are never to be given freedom. When a child, a woman must be strictly controlled by her father. When she is young, she must be strictly controlled by her husband. And when she is old, she must be controlled by her elderly sons. If she is given independence and allowed to mingle unrestrictedly with men, she will be spoiled. Не 
и возможно, и позволено общение не ограничено с мужчинами, оно будет испорчено. A spoiled woman being manipulated by paramours might even kill her husband. The example is given here because a yogi desiring to get free from material conditions must always keep his mind under control. Обрести свободы от материальных условий должен всегда держать свой ум под контролем. Шилабхати Сенанта Сарасвати Такур used to say that in the morning our first business is to beat the mind with shoes a hundred times and before going to bed to beat the mind a hundred times with broomstick. Шилабхати Сенанта Сарасвати Такур обычно говорил, что утром нужно Прежде всего, первым занятием должно быть отлупить ум сотню раз башмаком, и затем, перед тем, как отправиться спать, еще раз купить ум сто раз палкой. In this way, one's mind can be kept under control. Таким образом, ум будет под контролем. An uncontrolled mind and an unchaste wife are the same. Неконтролируемый ум и нечестивая жена – это то же самое. An unchaste wife can kill her husband at any time, and an uncontrolled mind, followed by lust, anger, greed, madness, envy, and illusion, can certainly kill the yogi. Так же, как нечестивая жена может даже убить своего мужа в любое время, так же неконтролируемый ум, который when a yogi is controlled by the mind, he falls down into the material condition. One should be very careful of the mind, just as the husband should be careful of an unchaste wife. Okay, where's the sound translated? Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Rama Hare Krishna Kuruna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jirak Pate Pupay Shivupika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastute Tapta Kancha Namurangi Radhi Kandana Nishwari Krishabana Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Pati Manjaka Padrubhyas Cha Kripasam Nubai Vicha Patitanam Bhavane Dyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namo Namaha Narayanam Namaskrit Cha Nadam Cha Iva Namo Patamam Devam Sarasatam Vyasam Tavakayam Vyadaya So what's the point that's being made in the verse today? Чем же суть стиха, который сегодня прочитан был? Hello. Can you tell me the point that's being made in the verse today? What's the example that Lord Rishab Dev gives in the verse? What, what does it say? So then what does it have to do with the yogi? If 
Very good. Very nice that you're listening. <coughs> so the main point is controlling the mind. And this is the basis of the process of yoga and meditation. Meditation. And it's the basis. And it's the basis of Krishna consciousness also. That we keep our minds and our senses um, thoroughly controlled and fixed in the service of the Lord. Now, Lord Vishabde, he uses a very powerful example. He says that if a woman is unchaste, then she'll easily be taken away by her lovers. And then because she fails to because she fails to have discrimination and chastity, she'll even be able to kill her husband. Now, Srila Prabhupada, he chose to give half of his purport to that statement. Prabhupada explained that in proper Vedic society, women were never given freedom. He said when the girl is young, she's strictly controlled by her father. And when she's a young girl, then she's strictly controlled by her husband. And then when she becomes old, she's strictly controlled by her senior sons that she will live with. So this is, is solely for the protection of the ladies. Because Srila Prabhupada has explained that the ladies, they don't have the power to discriminate in the same way that the men do. <coughs> They don't have the power to discriminate in the same way that men have. And so for that reason, they can become distracted from the path of self-realization. <coughs> Well, they can become distracted from what is the goal of life. Due to the fact that there are so many unchaste men in society who are eagerly willing to distract and spoil the ladies. So, this principle is there not to make the woman like a slave, but the principle is there to actually give women protection so that women can actually utilize the valuable goal of the human life. But when Srila Prabhupada would preach this principle, he would be attacked by people. At the time when Prabhupada was preaching in America, there was a movement going which was known as Women's Liberation. And they would attack Prabhupada as being a chauvinist. As a person who just wanted to control women. 
Тот, это человек, который пытается контролировать женщину. And Prabhupada used to take great delight when he would go and he would preach and then he would get attacked even in the newspapers. И когда Прабхупада отправлялся туда проповедовать, то он подвергался нападкам даже со стороны газет. So, Shiva Prabhupada one time he was flying from Chicago. Однажды Прабхупада прилетел из Чикаго. And he had been preaching this principle when he was in Chicago. То есть в Чикаго, и он там проповедовал этот принцип. And when he got on the airplane, somebody gave him a newspaper, and there was a whole article in the newspaper how Prabhupada was a chauvinist. И когда он был в аэропорту, у него брали интервью, и в газете вышла целая статья о том, что Прабхупада он шовинист. And Prabhupada he read the article and he started laughing. И когда Прабхупада прочел эту статью, он стал смеяться. And he said the ladies want to be independent, but the ladies should always be protected. И он сказал, что женщины не должны быть независимыми, но всегда быть под защитой. He said they feel that they're in liberated position. They feel that they're liberated. The ladies feel that they're liberated. Женщины чувствуют, что они освобождены. But they're not liberated. Но они на самом деле не освобождены. And then Prabhupada, he turned to one of his disciples and he looked at him and he said, if they want to be liberated, they should shave their heads. Он сказал, если они хотят быть, он повернулся к ученику, одному и сказал, если они хотят быть освобождены, они должны побрить свою голову. Brother said, I shave my head, and you boys shave your head. You're in liberated position. Он говорит, вы все ребята, и я, я брею свою голову, и вы также брейте голову. If they want women's liberation, tell them to shave their heads. Если они хотят освобождения для женщин, независимости, пусть побреют голову. Go tell them. Идите и скажите им. He turned to his disciple and he said, there is air hostess on the airplane. Go tell her to shave her head. И он сказал ученику, вот есть здесь стюардесса. Скажите, пусть как побреют свою голову. Go tell her now. Идите и скажите сейчас. Go tell her if she wants to be liberated like man, she should shave her head. Если она хочет быть освобождена как мужчина, пусть побреет голову. Go. Иди. Prabhupada's disciple, he sat there anyway. Prabhupada said, go now and tell her. And this disciple was just terrified. He didn't know what to do. And Srila Prabhupada looked at him and said, what is the matter with you? Prabhupada looked at him and said, what is the matter with you? И Прабхупада посмотрел на него и сказал, что с тобой? You cannot make joke. И ты не можешь просто пошутить. Прабхупада liked to make jokes. Прабхупада он любил шутить. So, it's an important point. Это очень важный момент. That we want to protect all of our ladies. Что мы должны защищать всех наших женщин. Because the goal of life is self-realization. And we want to make sure that people have an opportunity to pursue that goal nicely and not become distracted. But the mentality of everyone in society is that they're looking for sense gratification. Но ум настроения в обществе такого, что все лишь стремятся к чувственному наслаждению. And the height of that idea of sense gratification is enjoyment with the opposite sex. И пик, вершина этого чувственного наслаждения это наслаждение противоположным полу. The Shrimad Bhagavatam explains that people have the mentality that if they'll simply rub flesh together, then they'll become satisfied. В Shrimad Bhagavatam объясняется, что люди if they rub their flesh together, then they become satisfied. Люди думают, что если они будут плоть тереть друг от друга, то они будут удовлетворены. So people are ready to exploit one another for that variety of pleasure. И люди готовы эксплуатировать друг друга ради этого так называемого счастья. And so they generally have a mantra that they use, which is very good for exploiting one another. 
Они даже готовы получить мантру для того, чтобы лучшим образом эксплуатировать друг друга. Just like we have a mantra which is very good for self-realization. Подобным образом тут у нас есть мантра, которая хороша для самореализации. They have a mantra which is very good for exploitation. У них есть мантра, которая хороша для эксплуатации. Their mantra is I love you. Это мантра я люблю тебя. Я люблю тебя. Я люблю тебя. Я люблю люблю тебя. Тебя. Я люблю тебя. Я люблю тебя. Now people hear this mantra in the world and they lose their discrimination. It's such a powerful mantra. They think, oh, this person loves me. This person cares for me. But it doesn't mean that at all. What it means is I want to exploit you. И что же это значит, на самом деле, я хочу сплотировать? You have something that I want for my pleasure. У тебя что-то есть, что пригодно для моего наслаждения. You have a body that I can use for my pleasure. У тебя есть тело, которое я могу использовать для наслаждения себя. Or you can provide me some sort of emotional satisfaction. Или ты можешь мне предоставить некоторый вид эмоционального удовлетворения. Or if I capture you, then you can cook my food and wash my clothes. But is, the question is, is it love? It's not love at all. It's lust. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami describes the difference between love and lust. И в читании Чаритамрити Кришна Таска Вираджи Госвами объясняет разницу между любовью и похотью. He says that love is absolutely pure. Он говорит, любовь абсолютно чиста. And when one loves, he doesn't expect anything in return for that sentiment. И он говорит, что если кто-то любит кого-то, он не ожидает чего-то взамен на свою любовь. He says, but, but lust is when a person does something and they're expecting everything in return. Но похоть это означает, что когда человек что-то делает, ожидает что-то взамен для себя. Based on the gratification of the senses. И основано на удовлетворении чувств. So, Srila Prabhupada has said that in this material world, there's actually no real concept of love. Prabhupada говорит, что в материальном мире нет действительно представления о любви. In the past, Srila Prabhupada would say, that the closest conception that you can have to like selfless love in this world is the sentiment that the mother experiences for her child. Because mother will selflessly serve her child. Lord Chaitanya used that example when he was speaking to Hari Das Thakur and Sanatana Goswami. He told, he told Hari Das and Sanatana, he said, do you want to know the way I really think about you? He said, I think of you in the way that a mother thinks of her small children. <coughs> Very nice that Lord Chaitanya is experiencing that sentiment for his pure devotees. He said, sometimes the mother is giving service to the child. And the child passes stool or urine. He says, mother never takes offense. He said, in, in Chaitanya Charitamrita is described that the mother, she even takes the stool of her child and she, she's not offended, but she thinks it's like sandalwood paste. Yeah. 
Хотя ребенок даже испражняется на нее, она этим не оскорбляется, но даже воспринимает это как сандаловую пасту. Never takes any offense at all at what the child does. Она совсем не оскорбляется тем, что делает. So this is like this is like a a feeling of love. Это как чувство любви. But even that's changed these days. Ну даже сейчас, даже это сейчас уже изменилось. Is it the mothers they they even kill the baby in the womb before the baby is born? Потому что матери даже убивают ребенка в чреве, пока еще он не родился. So this is first side of the this is first side of the point that Prabhupada is making today. Это первая первая сторона того момента, который Прабхупада здесь объясняет сегодня. We should very very carefully protect our ladies so that our ladies can rise to the position of self-realization. Now, Srila Prabhupada says that if a lady becomes unchaste and if she's not properly controlled, then what might happen is she may be taken away by paramours. And in that situation she might even develop the mentality to kill her husband. Due to lack of good discrimination. So that's used as an example for people who are practicing the yogic process. Meaning that the mind should always be kept under control. If our minds are not under control, then our minds can cause us to fall again into the material pool. Если ум не будет под контролем, то он имеет возможность снова обусловиться материально. So Krishna explains this point to Arjuna throughout Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita Krishna объясняет этот момент Арджуне. And particularly in the third chapter, he explains this point nicely to Arjuna. И конкретно в третьей главе он это объясняет. In the third chapter, he explains to Arjun how he can work and how he can perform his duties in order to purify himself. In the beginning of the third chapter, the Lord tells Arjun that there, there are two paths of self-realization. He explains that one path is by work. And he explains that another path is by meditation. Now when Arjun hears this, he becomes a little bewildered. Because in the second chapter, the Lord has told Arjun that his qualification for self-realization will be to work very hard. Потому что в конце второй главы Господь объясняет Арджуне, что квалификация для самореализации дарка тяжело трудиться. So the path of of working in the Lord's devotional service and dovetailing everything in the Lord's devotional service is known as karma yoga, Krishna consciousness. И когда человек работает тяжело для Кришны в преданном служении, это называется karma yoga. And the path of of meditation is known as Jnana Yoga. So Arjun was attracted by this activity of meditation. Why was he attracted? Because he was a soft-hearted devotee. And he knew that if he had to work on the battlefield, he was going to have to kill a lot of people who were near and dear to him. What did Krishna do to Arjuna in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita? 
Arjuna said, he said, Govinda, do me a favor. Do something for me. He said, drive my chariot between the two opposing armies so I can see who I'm going to have to fight in this great battle. So what did Krishna do? Krishna started driving the chariot. And he drove the chariot and he parked it exactly in front of Arjun's grandfather and Arjun's guru. And then Krishna smiled. He said, these are some of the people that you're going to have to kill in this battle. So Arjun became really distressed. He said, he said, how can I kill my grandfather? How can I fight with my very guru? So because he was a soft-hearted devotee, he said, well, I think it's better for me to just go to the jungle and meditate. And to lead a very simple life. And Krishna said, no, your qualification will come by working in the service of the Lord. So in the beginning of the third chapter, again he mentions meditation and work. So Arjun tells the Lord, you've given me two instructions. Now clarify what you mean. So I'll actually choose the right path. So then the Lord, he starts to explain to Arjun the path of actually working but with a sense of renunciation. Renunciation. And he said, this is how you should actually function. You should perform your prescribed duties in society. But while performing those duties, you should offer the results of those duties to me. And by acting in this way, you'll become purified of the reactions to work. So, in other words, what he did is he taught Arjun how he should work properly, and in that way, the mind and senses would become purified and under control. So, he gave a whole instruction to Arjun on prescribed duties and work. And then in the end of the third chapter, what does Arjun say? He says, okay, now you've told me how to do things properly. But I have something to tell you. I have something to tell you. Even though I work properly, sometimes something pushes me where I don't want to work properly. Something starts to overwhelm me. And it makes me not want to perform my duties properly. So what is that thing which overwhelms me? It makes me work badly. And Krishna tells Arjuna that's lust. He's, it wasn't difficult for Krishna to answer the question. He says it's lust and it's the all-devouring sinful enemy of the world. 
Он говорит, это вожделение греховный, всепоглощающий враг этого материального мира. And he, he explained to Arjun that that lust is sitting within our bodies. И он объясняет Арджуне, что это вожделение пребывает в нашем теле. First of all, he tells Arjun that lust is born from contact with the material mode of passion. Прежде всего, он объясняет Арджуне, что вожделение возникает из соприкосновения с гуной страсти. Now, Srila Prabhupada explains something nice in his purport. И в комментарии Шила Пропада объясняет нечто очень замечательное. He explains that lust originally is love. И он говорит, что изначально вожделение является любовью. He explains that in our original state we are loving Krishna. Он говорит, что в изначальном состоянии мы все любим Кришну. But when that love comes in contact with the material mode of passion, it becomes transformed. Но когда любовь приходит соприкосновение с гуной материальной гуной страсти, она становится похотью. Prabhupada gives the example of cooking in the kitchen. He says, when you're in the kitchen, you can start to boil milk. And then you can put something sour, some sour substance inside the milk, and the milk will turn into cheese. So he says that originally our state is that we love the Lord. И он говорит также, наше изначальное состояние состоит в том, что мы любим Господа. But that love for Krishna has come in contact with Rajagun. Но затем любовь к Кришне приходит в соприкосновение с Rajagun. So it's become transformed. И это преобразуется. And instead of being love for the Lord, it's become lust. И эта любовь к Богу становится вожделением. So he says that lust is like a big, big fire. And it simply burns anything that comes in contact with it. So it sounds like lust is a dangerous thing. It sounds like lust is a dangerous thing. That if anything that comes in contact with it will simply burn. Все, что приходит с ним соприкосновение, просто сгорает в плах. So then Krishna tells Arjun that lust is situated within the body. И затем он говорит Арджуне, что вожделение расположено в самом теле. And he tells Arjun where the lust is situated. И он говорит даже, где оно расположено в теле. Where does he say? Что же он говорит? Right, he says that in our senses, lust is there. Mind, lust is there. In our intelligence, lust is there. So that lust is always burning in our senses. Therefore, we want to engage our senses in sense gratification. The mind is wanting to satisfy the demands of the senses. It's, it's always going on. So the idea that Krishna presents he says, you have to start to eliminate the enemy which is known as lust. And he says, the way to do that is by strictly engaging your senses in the process of bhakti yoga. Now, he could have told Arjun, that you start by your intelligence. He could have told Arjun to start by your intelligence. But our acharyas have explained that Krishna, he said, strictly engage your senses in the activities of bhakti yoga because the senses are more gross. No, Mind is more subtle thing. 
And intelligence is more subtle than the mind. So he says, begin by strictly regulating your senses and the activities of bhakti yoga. Then your senses will become purified. And then your mind will become purified because your mind is a sixth sense. The Srila Prabhupada would give the example of moving towards the sun. He would say that if you move towards the sun, you become warmer and warmer. So if you will engage your senses in the activities of bhakti yoga, then you'll move towards Krishna and your senses will gradually become more and more purified and the enemy lust will be removed. And then your mind will become purified of the enemy lust and engaged in the service of the Lord. So this is very important for us as devotees. Senses must always be engaged in Lord's service. And mind must be always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna. Many times in the Gita, Krishna pushes this mental culture of devotional service. Until he comes to like the ultimate instruction that he gives in Bhagavad Gita, which is to absorb your mind in thinking of me. He says in the 18th chapter, Manmana Bhavamad Bhakto Majjaji Mam Namaskuru Mam Ivaisa Sisatyante Pratijani Priyosi Me. He says, Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me. Offer your respect and honor to me. And he says, if you do this, I make a promise to you. My promise is that I'll take you back to the spiritual world. My promise is I will lift the influence of the material modes of nature and allow you to go back to the spiritual world. So this is our big responsibility. If we keep our senses and if we keep our mind engaged, then there's every chance that we will actually be able to perfect the process of Krishna consciousness. We can perfect the path of Krishna consciousness. But if the mind is not absorbed in thinking of Krishna, and if our senses are not nicely engaged, then the mind can become like the unchaste woman who will kill her husband. In the Gita, Krishna explains that if the mind will become attracted to even one of the senses, if the mind and senses aren't strictly controlled, that even a person who is very sober and a person who is very steady in self-realization can again 
be dragged down into sense gratification. So what is the most practical process for us to keep the senses and mind engaged in the Lord's service? We choose to apply the direct process. And the direct process is to hear about Krishna. And the essence of that is to chant the Maha Mantra. This, this chanting is such a potent process. More potent than, say, karma yoga, or jnana yoga, or mystic yoga. If one will directly engage his mind in the service of the Lord, he can be protected from falling down. One will engage his mind directly in the service of the Lord, he can be protected from falling down. Whereas we have many instances of yogis who have been practicing their meditation and yoga for thousands of years, but then their minds go out of control and they fall down. Just like in Vrindavan, about one kilometer from Krishna Balaram Mandir. There's a beautiful little ashram in the country. And it's on a hill above the Jamuna River. And that was the ashram of Sobari Muni. Sobari Muni. And Sabari Muni was a great yogi. And he used to sit on the bottom of the Jamuna and he used to perform yoga. And he stayed down there for thousands of years doing yoga on the bottom of the Jamuna. And one day while he was doing yoga, he opened his eyes a little bit. And he looked ahead and what did he see? He saw two fish engaging in sex life. Now, just by seeing that, his mind became agitated. And he fell down from the path of yoga. I mean, it couldn't have been so exciting seeing two fish engaging in sex. But his mind became disturbed and agitated. But then, look at the situation of Srila Haridas Thakur. He was the great Namachari of the chanting of the Holy Name. Haridas Thakur at one time was living in a cave uh, near Advaita Charya's house. It was a cave in the bank of the Ganga River. So Haridas, he was sitting inside of his cave. <laughs> and from morning to night, Haridas would simply chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Haridas would chant 64 rounds three times. Now, one time I made a calculation. On the basis of chanting one round in about six or seven minutes. And that amount of rounds it would take practically 24 hours to chant. But he would sit there in, in, in great ecstasy just chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. He wouldn't worry about 
about eating, wouldn't worry about sleeping. He simply had so much taste in chanting the Maha Mantra. His senses were absorbed. His mind was completely absorbed. He was oblivious to everything that was going on. Then one evening he was chanting in his cave. And one very, very beautiful lady came to his cave. This lady, she actually had the most beautiful features of anyone in the universe. And she was dressed in such an attractive way as to exhibit those features. So Haridas, Haridas was chanting and then he opened his eyes and he saw this lady there. And she looked at him and she said, O oh, Takur, I have come here for a specific purpose. I can see that you're the most young and handsome and qualified man that exists. Therefore, I've come here simply to have union with you. So Haridas, he just was chanting. He looked to the lady and said, Ochen Harasho. He said, very good. He said, I'll, I'll certainly satisfy all your desires. He said, but first I have to finish my japa. He said, I've taken a vow to chant so many rounds per day. As soon as my rounds are finished, then I'll satisfy you in any way that you want. And then he just continued. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And then Chaitanya Charitamrita describes what that lady started to do. So she started making different sorts of postures in front of Haridas Thakur. And it's described that the postures that she was making would make a, pers a, a very sober person like Brahma even become mad. But Haridas wasn't disturbed at all. Because his mind was so deeply absorbed in the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra that he had no attraction for what this lady was doing. <coughs> so then he just kept chanting. And then the end of the night came. And at the end of the night, the lady looked at me and said, do you know who I am? And then Haridas Thakur smiled and he said, of course I know who you are. And she said, I am Maya Devi. She said, I am a personification of the entire material cosmos and I've come before you to try to attract you. In other words, she was Durga Devi, who was attracting everyone within this material world. And she said, I came before you to attract you and I couldn't do it. 
Because you were so much, your mind and senses were so much absorbed in the chanting of this Maha Mantra. And, and then she told she told Haridas, she said, My husband Shiva, he initiated me in his mantra a long time ago. Said my husband Shiva, he worships Lord Ramachandra. So he's always chanting Ram, 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 Ram. And he initiated me in that mantra many years ago. But she said, I can see that you're tasting something in this chanting of Maha Mantra that is much sweeter and much more absorbing than even chanting this Ram Mantra. So she said, my desire is that you will, you will initiate me in the chanting of the Krishna Mantra. So Haridas said, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. And this way Haridas Thakur, he actually initiated my Devi. In the chanting of the Maha Mantra. So this is the direct process that we have to engage for our success in controlling the senses and the mind. Always hear this Maha Mantra. Always chant the Maha Mantra. Rupa Goswami, he wrote one very nice prayer describing the potency of the Maha Mantra. He said, who can understand how much nectar is contained in the two syllables Krishna? He said, when I hear these two senses, I mean, when I hear these two syllables, they go inside my ear, they go within my heart. My mind and my senses become completely under control. He said, and then I begin to chant this Maha Mantra. I begin to chant Krishna. He said, and, this, and the taste of that mantra is so sweet that I immediately desire to have millions of tongues. He says, then I start to hear Krishna. And the sound vibration is so sweet that I want to have millions of ears. So Mahaprabhu, Lord Chaitanya, he said, this is certainly the most wonderful description I've ever heard of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And if we'll chant with determination, it will have the same effect for us. What does it mean for us to chant with determination? That we'll chant Hare Krishna mantra avoiding the ten offenses to the holy name. This mantra has all potency to actually lift us to the transcendental platform. But we must avoid making mistakes in the chanting. So a devotee will very diligently avoid performing the ten offenses in the chanting of the holy name.
And then one will very quickly be elevated to the transcendental platform. So this is determination. And this is the great effort that we must make while chanting. And for us to actually advance in devotional service, two, two qualifications must always be... Well, actually for us to, to perfect our Krishna consciousness, two things must be there. One thing must be the great endeavor that we make with great determination in Krishna consciousness. And then when we make such a great endeavor, Lord Krishna will show His mercy to us. And when that mercy becomes revealed to us, when the mercy becomes bestowed upon us, then our path back to Godhead is very easy. Now, there's a good example of that. And we'll give the example because it's the month of Damodar. And it's the example of Mother Jasoda and Damodar. Now, you know, Mother Jasoda, this month of Damodar is this Damodar Lila. And Mother Jasoda, she was holding baby Krishna. She was giving milk to the baby. And then the milk on the stove was boiling. So Jasoda, she put the baby down and she went to take the milk off the stove. And when she put the baby down, the baby became very angry. And he started screaming. And he started breaking things. And he was breaking pots of yogurt. And he was doing all types of mischief. So Jasoda came back and saw what the baby had done. And she said, you rascal, I'm going to catch you and I'm going to beat you. And so then baby Krishna, he became very much afraid of Mother Jasoda. Kunti Devi says that this is an amazing thing. Is that Krishna is the Supreme Person. And that when his mother says, I'm going to beat you, he actually gets tears in his eyes. So, Jasoda Devi, she took up a stick. Started chasing the baby. And then all of the different ladies from the neighborhood, they came. And they were divided into two groups. One was the group saying, beat the child. Said, this kid comes to my house every day. He steals the yogurt. He steals the ghee and butter. He feeds it to the monkeys. You know, and I come in and I catch him in the middle and he says he's not doing anything. And then, you know, I have this new baby in my home. And it took me three hours to put my baby to sleep the other day. And as soon as I got the baby asleep, then Krishna came sneaking in and he came up to my baby and pinched my baby on his backside and the baby woke up again. They said, the kid's a rascal, you should beat him. And then when I catch him stealing the butter and yogurt, what does he do? 
И э, я его не могу поймать, когда я не могу поймать, he passes urine on the kitchen floor. То, когда он ворот делает, то что же он делает? То он мочится на пол. You know, so the kid's bad. Beat him up. And then the other group of gopis are saying, no, don't beat him because he's so beautiful and he's so sweet. So Jasoda decided that what she was going to do is she was going to tie Krishna up to that pot where they churn the yogurt. So she started calling for rope. Started telling her maid servants to bring rope. So she would put the ropes around Krishna's belly and around that clay pot, but the ropes were two fingers too short. So then she'd call for more rope. <coughs> Tie them together. <coughs> and then she'd put them around Krishna's belly in the pot. <coughs> and it was still two fingers too short. <coughs> Krishna's belly wasn't getting bigger. <coughs> the pot wasn't getting bigger. <coughs> but still it was two fingers too short. <coughs> now, Nanda Maharaj has millions of cows. And when they, whenever you have to milk a karof, you have to tie up the back legs of the karof. <laughs> so he had a lot of ropes laying around the house. So they were putting so many ropes together. And it was still two fingers too short. And so Jasoda Devi, she was like going crazy. And she was like, sweat was on her forehead. And her hair was falling down. And her sari was falling off her shoulders. And she's going, Krishna, Krishna. And she was like making such a massive endeavor in the direction of Krishna. And Krishna is just watching this whole thing going on. So she's going, Krishna, Krishna! And she was crying. And finally Krishna just looked at me and went, Krishna said, come in. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna said, how to show? That, that little baby just lifted his hand and he went, how to show? And, when, and he lifted his hand like that, he gave Jasoda his blessings. So then Jasoda, she tried to put the rope around Krishna's belly again. And the rope went all the way around Krishna's belly. It went all the way around Krishna's belly and it went around the pot and she tied it in a knot. And Krishna was tied up. You see, so how did it happen? It's not that, that Jasoda was very casual. No, she was making a big endeavor. She was, she was making such a huge endeavor. And then by making such an endeavor, Krishna gave his mercy. So our great acharyas have explained that that's what those two, the two fingers too short on the rope actually means. One finger is the endeavor of the devotee. And the other finger is the mercy of Krishna. So we have to make a big endeavor 
to keep our senses and mind engaged in the Lord's service. Мы должны делать огромные усилия для того, чтобы чувствовать ум, занять служение. What does it mean? Что это означает? We'll absorb ourselves in chanting the Maha Mantra. Это означает поглощать свой ум воспеванием Maha Mantra. We'll absorb ourselves in the instructions of our spiritual masters. И также поглощать свой ум выполняя наставления духовного учителя. We'll absorb ourselves in so many practical varieties of service in the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Srila Prabhupada explained that we have practical services which are given to us. Those services that were given are mercy from Krishna. We should see that they are given to us by Krishna directly. Мы должны увидеть это как то, что нам дано непосредственно самим Кришне. And we absorb our senses, we absorb our mind, we absorb our intelligence and how to execute those services perfectly. И мы должны поглощать свой ум и чувство, как их занимать полностью, совершенным образом в служении Кришне. Just like the soda made a big endeavor in the direction of of Krishna. We can make a big endeavor in the direction of Krishna also in controlling the mind and senses and intelligence if we'll keep these fully absorbed in the services which we've been given. This is like 24 years ago I joined the Hare Krishna movement. I was, I was a 20 year old boy at the time. And then I was attracted by the Maha Mantra. So I was in the temple and I was saying, chanting this Maha Mantra is great. And then about three days after I moved in the temple, they made me the temple commander. And we had a temple of about 60 people. And I had no, I had no idea what devotional service was. I had no idea what bhakti yoga was. And after three days, they made me the temple commander. So I started trying to organize something in the temple. And I was dealing with about 60 or so other 20, 22, 23-year-old wild American people. So after about a, so after about a week, I said, is this yoga? I said, I thought you did yoga to become peaceful. I said, I'm going crazy. You know, I'm trying to engage this guy and he tells me he's going to punch me. And then there's this one guy who will never get out of his sleeping bag. And then one guy who, one guy never gets up from taking prasadam. You know, from, from morning till night he's just sitting there, eating prasadam. I thought I was supposed to be becoming peaceful. I'm becoming a madman. So I'd go to my temple president and I said, what is going on here? He said, just absorb your mind, intelligence, and your senses in this duty, and, and by doing it, you can become Krishna conscious. So then I was in the temple for about two weeks. And I was approaching my first nervous breakdown. A nervous breakdown. So my temple president, he could see what my mentality was. 
So he took me in the office one morning. And he said, Prabhu, you know this afternoon we have the university program. And you know, every week at the university we have a big feast. And I can remember the week before. There's like sweet rice, slatkiris, samosas, halava, slatki sharik, sabji, pakora, chutney, yum 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 yum. Everything was really good. And then he said, I said, yeah, I remember the feast. He said, anyhow, the cook is sick today. So, I want you to go to the kitchen and cook a feast. What are you telling me? I don't know how to cook. He said, just go in the kitchen. I'll send somebody to help you. But just depend on Krishna. Absorb your senses, absorb your mind, absorb your intelligence in this activity. You can become perfect. And I went, Borsha boy, <laughs> what's going on? But I went to the kitchen. And somehow or other I made a feast. And, and and when I when I cooked that feast, then I became addicted to cooking. Now I didn't know how to cook. But how did I look at the situation? I thought Prabhupada has given me this service. Krishna has given me this service. So let me do it perfectly. And, and so then I just applied my devotional service in that way. And I became absorbed. And became like, in this kind I'm known as a cook. And then after some time, the temple president said, now go on Sankirtan. And I went, Sankirtan? I have to go out and meet the karmis? And talk to the karmis all the time? I don't want to do that. He said, but Prabhupada, he said, but Prabhupada said that saving the conditioned souls is what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Then I just absorbed my mind, intelligence, and senses in that service. And Krishna helped me in every way. So in each of our endeavors, we have to make such a great effort. And then Krishna will bestow his mercy upon us. And then we'll actually, by Krishna's grace, we'll become protected from the influences of the material energy. So we should practice our devotional service in that way. Every person in every department of the temple they should absorb themselves in their service and try to perfect that service for the pleasure of their spiritual master and the pleasure of Krishna. <laughs> and then Krishna will bestow his mercy. Okay, thank you very much. Спасибо большое. Any questions?
Все слышали вопрос. Веда говорится, что знание уже содержится в нашем сердце, почему же нужно слушать от Кришны? Если можно просто повторять. Если можно просто повторять Хари Кришна Мантру. Chanting the Mahamantra is one aspect of hearing. And this is the essential practice of hearing. Hearing topics of Krishna has different aspects. Krishna has name. He has form. He has qualities. And he has pastimes. So we should chant the Maha Mantra and we should also hear the directions and the instructions of how to approach Krishna through the process of Bhakti Yoga. Now, Lord Chaitanya had his great disciple whose name was Raghunath Bhatta Goswami. And he came down to Jagannath Puri to live with Lord Chaitanya. So then when he was going to leave, Lord Chaitanya gave him different instructions. Lord Chaitanya told him, you should chant Hare Krishna 24 hours a day. And you should hear Srimad Bhagavatam 24 hours a day. So how can he execute such an instruction? One side of the mouth is doing Maha Mantra and the other side of the mouth is doing Srimad Bhagavatam. The Srimad Bhagavatam and the Maha Mantra are non-different. So, sometimes he would chant Maha Mantra and sometimes he would hear the descriptions of Srimad Bhagavatam that reveal all of the different aspects of the Lord. So, we hear the topics of the Lord in the Shastra and then we chant the Maha Mantra. The process is by this hearing we wash our consciousness. Lord Chaitanya has said, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhvi Kabunoi Shavanadi Suvichitta Kodavei Udoi. He has said that eternal love for Krishna is present within your heart. He says, Sadhya Kabunoi. He says that that perfection cannot be achieved in any other place. It's present within your heart. But then he says, Shravanadi Shuddha Chitta. He says that your Chitta, or your consciousness, has to become purified by the process of Shravana. And then the love will automatically awaken. So, if one is a very highly qualified soul, he can sit like Haridas Thakur and he can just hear Hare Krishna 24 hours a day.
И если такой человек достиг этой квалификации, он может как передаст такой, воспевать 24 часа в сутки. But we're not like that. И нам это нравится. So we need to hear the practical descriptions. А, мы еще не, не таковы, как он. We need to hear the practical descriptions of the science of Krishna that are described in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. If we hear these practical descriptions, then our faith will increase. And just like Krishna said last night in Bhagavad Gita, he says, you have to hear from me. Hear how I'm the source of everything material, and I'm the source of everything spiritual. Hear how I'm the source of the three modes of material nature. Hear how the three modes are my, my nature, and I'm never under the influence of the three modes. Hear how being influenced by the three modes, some people will never surrender to me, and some people will approach me and surrender. When he says, and if you hear these topics from me, then you'll be able to understand me in full, even at the time of death. So we hear the topics. And we develop our faith. And our understanding. And then we absorb ourselves with more determination in the chanting of the holy names. <laughs> it's like to come to the clearing stage of chanting the Maha Mantra, we have to understand so many facts about Krishna. We have to actually understand in truth how Krishna is the Supreme Person. We have to understand the real position of the living entity. We have to understand material and spiritual nature. We have to understand what is time and we have to understand what is karma. Then we'll be able to chant with what's known as sambandhikyan, or knowledge of our relationship with the Lord. And then that will actually bring us to the position of following nicely the process of devotional service. Lord Chaitanya has described devotional service in this way. He says, first division of, of knowledge is known as sambandha, or knowledge of our relationship with the Lord. And he's explained that beyond that is Abhideya, or knowledge of the process of devotional service. So we have to cultivate transcendental knowledge of Krishna to engage ourselves very, very nicely and attentively in the process of devotional service. Knowledge of Krishna. And cultivating knowledge of Krishna means hearing about Krishna. Just like the point that we made last night, understanding that we're not the body is knowledge. But that's a realization that we can have by being situated in the mode of goodness. But to actually understand Krishna is transcendental knowledge. 
because Krishna is transcendental to the modes of material nature. So to understand that, we have to hear about Krishna from Krishna himself or from Krishna's representative. Then we can be lifted to the transcendental position. So both of the activities are very, very important. Or it's like Srila Prabhupada says that the holy name of Krishna is just like Krishna. So in the first verse of the Bhagavatam, there are two descriptions given of Krishna's nature. One says that Krishna is a Vigya. Abhigya. What does Abhigya mean? Means that he's fully conscious of everything that's going on in the universe. And then the second definition of Krishna's character is that he's Swarat. So that means that he's independent. Independent. So in the holy name of the Lord is none different than Krishna. The holy name of the Lord is none different than Krishna. That means that <coughs> That means that the Holy Name is fully conscious of everything going on in the universe. And it means that the Holy Name is independent. So it means that the Holy Name doesn't depend on anything. The Holy Name doesn't depend on following Vedic rules and regulations. Prabhupada said that the Holy Name doesn't even depend upon initiation. But Prabhupada says, if one will properly get himself initiated, then here is the descriptions of Krishna from the Holy Shastra, from the spiritual master. Then it will make the process of purification even more rapid so two things must be there absorption in the holy name and hearing these descriptions of Krishna from the Shastra and that will increase our faith and determination okay anything else Krishna is not dependent on any other thing for Krishna's happiness or for Krishna's success. Now Krishna presents himself as the holy name. And the holy name will certainly purify. But there's a science in chanting the holy name. He said, there's a science in serving Krishna. But what is that science in serving Krishna? 
that every that 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 service must be rendered free from the desire for material gain. Это служение должно быть свободно от желаний материальных обретений. Free from the desire for liberation. Свободно от желания освобождения. Favorably cultivated for the pleasure of Krishna. И благоприятным образом культивируемого. It's not anything that we whimsically do we can call devotional service. Не нужно ничего делать по своей прихоти в служении Кришне. But there's a science for actually serving Krishna purely. Но есть наука в том, чтобы служить Кришне чисто. Otherwise, why would Srila Rupa Goswami have written a book like Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu to describe the process of pure devotional service? Иначе зачем бы Srila Rupa Goswami написал такую книгу как Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, описывающую процесс преданного служения? So Krishna is certainly independent. Кришна, несомненно, независим. And the holy name is certainly independent. But if you want to chant the holy name properly, and if you want to follow the process of devotional service properly, then there's a science for doing it. You see, so you have to learn how to properly vibrate the name. Free from offenses. How to properly execute all of the different activities of devotional service free from offense. His holy name is purifying everyone in the universe. It's purifying the trees, it's purifying the animals, it's purifying us. You know, it's brought us to this path of devotional service. But if we want to, to understand how to do it properly, then we have to, then we have to make effort. We must make endeavor. Yes, bro. nectar of devotion, the same Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu describes the beginning stages of devotion. And that's called sadhana bhakti. See, the activities that we're engaging in, these are the beginning stages of devotional service. What does sadhana mean? Sadhana means that we're practicing. We're practicing to become devotees. Now Lord Chaitanya has said in the Chaitanya Chaitamrita that sadhana is the activity that will give birth to ecstasy. So what, is, so what is the idea of sadhana bhakti? 
That there's 64 activities of devotional service. That there's nine activities of devotional service. That there's five activities of devotional service. Or there's the one essential activity of devotional service, which is to chant the holy name. And by engaging in these activities, we can absorb our senses in contact with the Lord. And then that absorption it acts like the iron rod on the fire that Srila Prabhupada always described. It acts like the iron rod our senses become purified and our mind becomes absorbed in Krishna and we get very very eager and enthusiastic just to hear about Krishna to the point that we'll actually We'll actually get to the point where we can't live without hearing about Krishna. And then when we develop such intense enthusiasm to always be hearing about Lord Krishna. Then Krishna will bestow his mercy. And then you'll come to the spiritual platform. Then practice stops. And then you're perfect. Lord Krishna describes that position in Bhagavad Gita. He calls it Brahma Bhutta. He says, Brahma Bhutta Prasanna Mana Sochiti Nakamshiti Samak Sarveshi Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Nakati Param. He says that you come to the spiritual platform, you become happy all the time. No hankering, no lamentation. You see the true equality of all living beings. And the most wonderful thing is from that position, then you're able to engage in direct devotional service to the Lord. So Srila Prabhupada said that actual devotional service begins with the position of perfection. And what we're doing now is practice devotional service for our purification. So those are the beginning stages of devotion service. Okay. Activities of devotional service we described. The Everything is described there. And then, how will one practically implement the sadhana of bhakti yoga? He hears from the spiritual master. And he follows the spiritual master's instructions. The spiritual master will teach the disciple how to execute the chanting of Hare Krishna properly. How to hear from the Shastra. We'll hear this discussions on, on practically how to engage the mind and senses in the Lord's service. 
И как э, практически занимать чувство и ум в служении Господу? В этом состоит садхана бхакти. Yes, а, вот, Кришна говорит, что ему, для него нет никого дороже, чем его чистые преданные, но в то же время он посылает своих чистых преданных, проповедует материальный мир, где очень много опасностей. Вот. Каким образом можно объяснить это, такое состояние? Все слышали вопрос? А им говорит, это очень ценится. Но будет все дир, фин. It's explained that the devotee of the Lord is very merciful. The Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that one shouldn't disturb the minds of the ignorant people. But rather, one should engage the ignorant people in whatever activities they're following with the spirit of devotion. But Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport that the devotees of the Lord are sometimes more merciful than the Lord. And they're willing to take the risk to engage people in the Lord's service. So for that reason, Krishna says that they're so dear to me. His point in Bhagavad Gita is he says that no one is more dear to me than the person who's actually preaching Bhagavad Gita to the devotees. You see, so it's like the devotees desire to render service to the Lord. Это потому что преданный имеет желание, desire. It's the devotee's desire that he will come and that he'll preach in order to render devotional service. Это предано, это желание преданного прийти и проповедовать славу Господа. And then what is the position? What is the position of the pure devotees? Каково же положение чистого преданного? What did Prahlad tell Lord Nishingadev? He said, <clears throat> he said, I've rendered so many services to you. And I don't expect anything in return. He's in the material nature can't touch me. So that's the position of the pure devotees. They simply want to serve Krishna. In heaven or hell. Or even in Samara. Because they simply engage in the Lord's service, but they want to remain absorbed in hearing and chanting about the Lord. In that way, they remain transcendental to any uh, disturbance of material nature. Okay, we're going to stop now. All the devotees should carry on enthusiastically with their services today. We'll get together this evening and we'll have another big kirtan. You know, more chanting and dancing. Some discussion from Bhagavad Gita. How many devotees here go out for book distribution? Have they already gone? 
So everyone should hurry up and get out on book distribution. And the construction devotees are already constructing. Anyone? They're already working outside. Anyone here does construction? They're already working outside. So all of the other devotees do your services, and in the evening we'll come together, and we'll have some more kirtan and discussion with each other.